Let's give Caleb a really big round of applause. Thanks. Peter Piper picked a pick of pickled peppers. If Peter Piper picked a pick of pickled peppers, where are the pickled pickle, pickle peppers Peter Piper picked? Mike. Mike? Mike doesn't seem to be working. <laughs> okay, so these slides are blank. Repeat after me. These slides are blank. These slides are blank. Nothing is broken. My name is Caleb Thompson. I've been a developer for about 10 years. I have a degree in software engineering, and I've worked with all sorts of customers from native to mobile apps and different businesses and customers and consulting and everything else. Now I work at Heroku, where I help people like you get your apps up and running. And today I'm going to tell you a job about how I took a job building software to kill people. But don't get distracted by that. I didn't know it at the time. Even before I'd walked across the stage for graduation, I accepted an offer for an internship from a Department of Defense contractor. The Department of Defense, or DOD, is the part of the government in the United States made up by the military. At the time, I didn't really think anything of the fact that I'd be working for the military. Besides, my parents were in the military, or my dad was in the military, so was my grandfather. I have great respect for those who serve in our armed forces. It was a great opportunity, good money, and a good friend of mine had gotten me the gig. I was really excited about this. The team had already started on their project, and the gist of it was that they were going to find Wi-Fi hotspots based on how the signal changed as your phone moved around and received different signal strengths. If the signal strength got stronger, you were probably moving closer to the source, and if it got weaker, you were probably moving further away. To, to find that, we would collect two pieces of information about uh, each location. We would collect the location on your phone, and we would collect the signal strength for every GPS hot, or every Wi-Fi hotspot and range. It seemed really cool compared to what I'd done to this point. I think the most complicated thing I'd built was an inventory management system. That was an app that didn't really care about databases and persistence. The data was all right there in memory, and if it forgot how many Aerosmith CDs you had, who cares? <laughs> Honestly, the idea of finding Wi-Fi hotspots based on how the signal strength changed was kind of intimidating to me. I was impressed by the idea. But don't get distracted by that. The software was intended to kill people. To predict the actual location of the Wi-Fi signal, we used a convolution of two algorithms. Now, this is the part of the talk where it gets a little bit technical, but don't worry about it if you don't understand. The, the story is the important part, not the tech. The first algorithm was R squared. It's the difference between the signal strength that you would expect to find at a location and the actual signal strength. And so the smallest difference between those two is the most likely distance you are from an actual location. The second algorithm was Gaussian estimation, and we would combine these two together. So Gaussian estimation says, here is a probability curve for where the, lo where the signal is coming from. And it's actually using two curves. The first is a negative one that says you're probably not standing right next to the thing that you're trying to find. And the second one is a positive curve, the kind of the standard distribution that you're used to seeing. And it says, at some point further out, that's probably where the signal is. So the algorithm would adjust the height and width and distance between these two points, these two curves, to determine, based on the past measurements, to determine the most likely location for the signal source to originate. It created a heat map of probabilities for each location in a search grid. We would combine those two algorithms to get the more accurate um, and, and normalize their output to get a more accurate location estimation than either algorithm on its own could provide. If we collected readings while moving in a straight line, we could tell you how far away a signal was. If you turned, we could also give you the direction. Climb some stairs, we can tell you in three-dimensional space where this Wi-Fi signal is located. This is the most interesting project I had worked on to this point. It's probably still the most interesting project from a technical perspective. But don't get distracted by that. The software was designed to kill people. I spent a lot of my time pairing on performance improvements to this code. It worked, but it took about seven minutes to find things. That's partially because we had originally implemented this algorithm in MATLAB, which is optimized for working with matrices of numbers, so the two-dimensional array that we talked about earlier. The Java code that we wrote, which is very similar, um, had those two nested, uh, had nested loops. So instead of two, we actually had four nested loops. And inside, there was some really expensive calculations happening. The whole thing was super slow. One example is calculating the distance between two points. 
Now, because we were calculating locations, we needed to calculate the distance between two points on a sphere, like Earth. So we used an algorithm called great circle distance, which measures the closest distance between two points over the surface of that sphere. The function performing this calculation was being hit hundreds of thousands of times for each collection point, often with the same two locations. So to kind of get around that, we implemented a hash where the key was the two locations that we were trying to find the distance between, and the value was the distance between them. That way we could look that up instead of recalculating every time. This sped things up considerably with, combined with a few other optimizations we made. But don't get distracted by that. The performance increase made it faster to kill people. The accuracy of the locations wasn't fantastic either. I don't remember the exact error rate, but something like 45 feet sticks in my head. That's significant when the average range for a Wi-Fi router is only about 100 feet. So we're talking the distance between where it actually was and what the, where we thought it was is almost half that range. So I talked about that Gaussian estimation, the second algorithm. Well, those curves were defined by constants in our code. They were the starting points. Um, they were just the starting points, but they were used every time we made this calculation. During my software education, I learned about a tool that I never really thought I would get to use in the real world. It's called a genetic algorithm, and it's a type of machine learning program that takes a set of values and optimizes for a desired result. So in our case, we could give it the set of values that defined these curves, as a, in, that's the gene in genetic algorithm parlance, and we could run it through a fitness function, which is the, distant, the location algorithm's accuracy, the distance between where we think it is and where we actually, it actually is. For the data set of readings I was using in the GA, I knew the actual location of the access points. That meant that I could run this geolocation algorithm with the genes constants in place from the genetic algorithm and look at the distance between where the algorithm thought it was and where it actually was. The shorter the distance between those two, the better the algorithm was performing. During this, doing this a lot of times with a lot of populations of genomes, each time keeping the top performers but making small changes to them and throwing away poor performers and replacing them with new random values, I was able to find the top performers across all of these populations. When the genetic algorithm ended, I could look at the best performers across every single iteration. So I let that genetic algorithm run over the weekend. It was able to increase the accuracy from 40 odd feet to 10 feet. That's about 25% the error of the original, and it's actually more accurate than the phones than we were collecting data from. This means that the algorithm had probably overfit to the data set that we were training it on. And it might not be as accurate against real world data. That problem is called overfitting in machine learning, and the way around it is to have separate sets of data that you test and, and the data that you train the algorithm on. I didn't know that at the time, though. This stuff was great. Genetic algorithms, R squared, Gaussian estimation, there's just the sorts of things that you never think you'll get to use in the real world. But we were using them in a real world project, and it was my first project out of school. Being a programmer was going to be great. But don't let that distract you. This accuracy made it fast, easier for the software to kill people. We'd been working with a project owner throughout this process. Whenever we hit one of these milestones, we'd tell him about it. He'd be excited, but the same question always came up. Can you find people's phones? Can you use the signal to find where the phones are? He wanted to sniff out the signals that the phones were putting out in addition to those that they were receiving from the Wi-Fi hotspot. Now this is kind of difficult from a technical perspective because it means that you have to change a setting on the wireless network controller. And neither Android nor iPhone allow you to do that out of the box. You would have to jailbreak or root the phone. You'd also need an additional software package that would let you sniff these packets, even if you're receiving them. So we looked around for a piece of software that would let us do that. We used um, something called SourceForge. I don't know if you even know what that is anymore. GitHub kind of replaced that completely. We found something, but we didn't really understand uh, what it was, or, and it wasn't very well documented. So we went to the project owner and said, can we come back to this later? Like, we've, we're working on Wi-Fi hotspots. We don't really, we're not super concerned about phones. He said, yeah, sure, we can come back to this later. But each time we would demonstrate a new and exciting tech, 
the same question would come up. We got Wi-Fi hotspots working, located. Great, does it find phones? It's working in minutes instead of seconds. Great, does it find phones? We looked into it and it doesn't seem likely that we'll be able to find phones, but maybe, can we come back to that? Sure, no problem. Look at this genetic algorithm. It's so much more accurate now. Great, does it find phones? I had been distracted. All these cool problems we were solving, speeding things up, making more accurate predictions. It was all so cool, so much fun. I hadn't really thought to stop and think about why we were putting so much work into finding a better place to sit and get good Wi-Fi. It doesn't even make sense if you think about it. It's not a problem that real world people have, and it's certainly not a problem that the Department of Defense is trying to solve. Does it find phones? This had never been about finding Wi-Fi hotspots. It had always been about finding phones. Phones carried by people. I had been building a tool for the government, for the military, to find phones based on where their, find people where their, based on where their phones were and shoot them. I rationalized this then. The military is in pr place to protect truth, justice, and the American way. But this is the same time that we found out that the government had been spying on Americans in the United States with drones, and that they had lent out that technology over 700 times to state, local, and federal law enforcement agents to do their own missions. The military is a tool of the government, and it seemed like we couldn't trust the government as well as we had thought. I didn't want to be a part of building something that would be used to kill people, especially when I knew I would never know who it was used against, let alone have a say in that decision. I rationalize it now, too. We were interns, and we didn't have security clearances. The government, the projects that this company did for the government required top secret clearances. We weren't even allowed to know what they were. The code that we built probably got thrown away and forgotten. This is an extreme example of code that was used in a way that the creator didn't intend it, but the project owner conveniently left out his purpose, and we conveniently didn't ask too many questions. It was great pay at the time. It was a great opportunity. And maybe we just didn't want to know what it would be used for. I got distracted. I was distracted by the tech, but maybe you could also be distracted by a cool framework that a company is using, or the great design of a project that looks really good in your portfolio. These office amenities are great. They've got a nap room. <laughs> the team is already working on this. They must have thought through all of this stuff, right? Like, it's fine. That's just another distraction. There are other examples of when code is used in ways that it wasn't intended, and of code that just does bad things. But the unifying factor in all of these stories is that developers and designers built these dangerous and unethical tools. Like you and me, these are the people who are doing it, this room. As a profession, we have a superpower. We can make computers do things. We build tools, and some responsibility lies with us to determine how they're going to be used, and make sure that they're not going to be used in ways that we're not OK with. Not just what the intention is, but what misuses might come out of them. None of us wants to be building things that are going to be used for evil. So how can we carefully consider the impacts of the code that we're building? I don't really have all the answers to that. I don't really think that there is an answer, because if there was, then I have to believe we wouldn't be doing it in the first place. But I do have a couple ideas. The first is just to think through the worst possible use of the software you're building. So say I'm signing people up for emails by default. The worst possible case is that they unsubscribe and stop being a customer. Am I willing to sell my hypothetical startup soul for a better mailing list, especially when that might be all that keeps it afloat? Yeah, no problem. Nobody's getting hurt there. It's kind of shady, but it's not the end of the world. If I had thought through that same thing with the Wi-Fi geolocation algorithm, I think I would have come to a very different conclusion. The other idea I have is to just not take the request at face value. When the defense contractor came to me and said, we need to build an app that builds Wi-Fi networks, it was all true, but it wasn't the whole truth that finds Wi-Fi networks. Asking them or myself why enough times might have led me to an earlier conclusion. Why? To find the phone. Why? To go to them. Why? It's a major problem when we're given so much power in tech, but we're not doing anything to ensure that it's used safely. Thinking about what we're doing and, being, and 
being careful not to build things that can be used dangerously is the least that we can be doing. Don't get distracted by deadlines and feature requests. Think about the consequences of what you're building. Build in safeguards to prevent misuse, or don't build it at all because it's too dangerous. I'm asking you to do something about this, but it's only fair that we talk about when and where to make that stand. So there's a few questions that I think you should ask. Can you afford to leave today without a job? Because that's a real possibility. Can you rely on your network to kind of get you a new job before your savings runs out? Do you have the sort of relationship with your employer where you can go to them with this kind of thing and be heard out rather than just shown the door? The answer to me in 2011 was no for all of those questions. Sometimes something is still important enough that you should take that stand. I'd like to think that I would. Different scenarios, though, need different ways of thinking about what you're doing. Sometimes the right thing to do is to just say nothing and build the product. It's not an easy decision to make, but don't get distracted by having to think through it. Sometimes your code can kill people. No homework. <laughs>